Hi everybody, I'm Aaron Parecki. I'm a senior security architect at Okta. I'm also a member of the OAuth working group at the IETF, and I've been in the web standard space for quite a long time now. If you've ever Google anything about OAuth, you've probably landed on the website I maintain, which is OAuth.net. It's a lot of great resources for finding things about OAuth. And if you ever see anything wrong with it, please feel free to contribute. The link is at the bottom and you can add your own resources and things you find on there. So before we talk about how to hack OAuth, I want to talk a little bit about what OAuth is. If you ever tried to read anything online about OAuth, I apologize because it can often feel like trying to find your way through a maze of content. It is not obvious how these things fit together. OAuth is not just one spec. It's made up of a whole bunch of specs. So instead of going through the specs, we're actually going to take a step back and first talk about how we got OAuth in the first place. So do you remember seeing this kind of thing online like, I don't know, 10 years ago or so? This was a very common pattern on the internet a long time ago. This new app like Yelp would launch and it would ask you to enter your password for your email address in order for it to go and find your friends to see if they are already using Yelp, which is like a very cool feature, but this is a terrible way to do that. And we understand that now, but it wasn't limited to just Yelp. It was also like Facebook doing this, but users were happily giving their logins to these services because they actually did want what the application was promising, which was the ability to find their friends. So what we're looking for is a solution for how can we let applications access the contacts in their API, but not have it also access the person's emails. And that was the original problem that OAuth set up to solve, which was how can we let an application access data in an API without giving that application your password? After the OAuth flow is complete and the user has allowed the application access to their account, that application will have an access token, which is a string of characters that doesn't mean anything to the application. That string of characters is then used in an API request to access that API. What's interesting is that nothing in this process actually tells the application about the user. It doesn't actually tell the application who logged in. And that's totally fine. OAuth was not created as a single sign-on protocol or as a way to talk about user identity. It was created to access APIs. So I like to use this analogy of checking in at a hotel, which seems like a funny idea right now. You go to the front desk, you give that person your ID and your credit card, they give you back this hotel key. You take that hotel key and you swipe the key on the door and the door lets you in. Now, in order for this system to work, the key card doesn't actually need to represent you a person. It just needs to represent that you have access to this door. So the door doesn't even care about who you are. The door just cares about whether this key card has access. So in OAuth terms, the person at the front desk is the authorization server. The key card is the access token and the door is the API. With that kind of background out of the way, let's now talk about how OAuth works just enough so that we can see where some of the holes are that we can start poking at in order to actually break it. So all of OAuth is modeled around these five roles. These are roles defined in the spec. The terms at the bottom are the spec terms for them. And those aren't typically things that we use in a conversation when we talk about this. Instead, we talk about users and APIs and applications but they're basically interchangeable. So the flow starts off with the user visiting the application's website or launching the mobile app. And then they click the button that says log in. The app says, great, don't give me your password. I can't use your password. So instead go over to the OAuth server and log in there. So that causes the user to land at the OAuth server where they then log in. And then they will see this prompt asking them, do you allow this request? If they click yes, the OAuth server generates a one-time use authorization code and sends it back in a redirect to the user's browser to have the user's browser deliver it back to the application. So once the application has the authorization code, it can now go and get an access token. And it does that by making a post request back to the OAuth server to exchange that. This is a step where it can also include its client secret, its own password, so that the OAuth server knows that that code was not stolen in that redirect step. So the OAuth server validates that request, checks the client secret, and creates an access token and returns it in the response. Now the application can go use the access token to request data from the API. So the blue lines on top are what we call front channel. And that's the idea where we're actually using the user's browser to move data between parties. The pink lines are the back channel, and that's the sort of more normal one where we're sending data from a client to a server over HTTPS. I like to think of this as hand delivering a message where you can walk up to somebody, you can hand them a thing, you can see them, they can see you. You can see they took it. You can be sure that nobody else stole it in that process. Sending data over the front channel is more like throwing it over a wall and just kind of hoping they catch it, where you can't actually be sure that they caught it. You can't tell if somebody stole it mid-flight. You can't tell if it just landed on the floor. And on the other side, there's a similar problem, which is that on that side, you can't actually be sure where it's coming from. 
you don't actually know if it's from the real OAuth server or from a fake OAuth server. So you might be wondering, well, why do we use the front channel at all then if it's so risky or insecure? It does have a few really important properties that it turns out is very useful in OAuth. One, it's the way that we can actually be sure that the user was in front of their computer when they logged in because it's the OAuth server that is collecting their password. But also importantly, it's a way for applications to be able to receive data even when they don't have a public IP address, which for things like mobile phones or JavaScript apps turns out is really important. Okay, so that was the quick overview of what OAuth is. Now let's move on to the hacks. So it turns out there's a lot of ways to hack OAuth. In fact, most of them are documented in the specs themselves. There's a handful of attacks documented in the core, the original document. There was a document put out about specifically OAuth in mobile apps, which again talks about some of the particular aspects unique to the mobile app environment. There's also a new document called OAuth 2 Security Best Current Practice, and that is a huge list of other ways that this can kind of go wrong. So I'm gonna save you from that because those are well documented and well understood. Instead, I wanna focus on a couple of attacks that happened in the real world that actually resulted in some pretty big press headlines. So I'm gonna start off with this one, which is Twitter. Back in 2013, there were a bunch of headlines that came out about how Twitter's API keys were stolen or leaked or whatever you wanted to call it. So what happened was someone went and downloaded all the Twitter apps on all the different platforms like iPhone, Android, Windows Phone, and then decompiled them and extracted the strings out of them, and then posted all those API keys on GitHub. The result of this hack was that basically anybody can now impersonate the Twitter apps. The lesson here that we learned was you can't put secrets in native apps. It just doesn't work. There's no way to do it because anybody who downloads that app is downloading that secret and can just decompile it. So this was actually one of the major problems with OAuth 1, which is that it was entirely based around this idea of using a secret for that application to sign requests. And that secret was always provisioned by the developer and then put into the application, which works fine for web-based apps where users don't have access to the source code. But when we're talking about mobile apps, the users download those apps, download the secrets with them, and can extract them, like we saw. So that was a major problem with OAuth 1, and that was actually a huge motivator in deciding to start a new version of the spec. So OAuth 2 avoids the need for a client secret in the cases where we can't use one, because of this additional extension added to OAuth. Pixie, P-K-C-E, is basically a solution for how to do OAuth with applications that can't use a secret. Let's now walk through the flow again, but look at what's changed. So it starts off the same, the user clicks on the application and says, I would like to use this application, please log in. Now, this time, the app first generates a new secret, random secret, for this request, stores it internally, and then calculates a hash of that secret. Then, when it builds a URL that it's gonna launch the user into a browser, it includes that hash value in that URL. So that causes the user's browser to deliver the hash to the OAuth server. Now, the OAuth server still, again, gets the user to log in and prompts them for permission and then it issues that temporary code, but it also remembers the hashed value. The user's browser delivers that temporary code back to the application, and now the application is ready to go and exchange that code for an access token. This time, because it doesn't have a pre-registered client secret, it does have that secret that it's holding onto from when it started the request. So it includes that raw secret value in this request. And what that does is it lets the OAuth server say, okay, well, when I issued that code, I remember seeing this hashed value, so that means whoever is going to get this code now has to prove that they were the ones that started the request. And to do that, if they include the secret they use to generate that hash, the OAuth server can hash that value itself and compare the two hashes to see if they match. And then it can respond with the access token. And then we're done and everything moves on. All right, let's talk about the next one. And this is about hacking JSON web tokens or JWTs. So these headlines were going around around 2015 when a whole bunch of libraries were found to be vulnerable to the same problem. And that was that many libraries were actually not validating JSON web tokens properly. JSON web tokens are often used for API authentication where your access token might be a JSON web token. Here's what a JSON web token looks like. There's a header, a payload, and a signature. Without being able to validate this, somebody could go in here, modify the payload, the middle part, change data, change a username, change a permission, things like that, and then repackage it up and then send it to the API and try to make API requests. If it's not validating it properly, it would then just read whatever data is in the middle and then the attacker is in. So the thing about JSON web tokens is that the header part talks sort of about the token. One of the things in the header is a description of how the token was signed. 
And there's a couple of different options available to you if you're creating a JSON web token. One of the signing mechanisms is RS-256, and that's an asymmetrical algorithm where you use a public key to verify it and a private key to sign it. Now, it just so happens that there's also a signing algorithm called none, and that means there's no signature. So the hack here is that you go get a real access token that's probably signed using RS-256. Then you go inside the token, you change the data you want in the middle part, the payload, and then you change the signing algorithm to none and then make an API request. And then if that server first looks at the header to decide how to validate the token, it'll see the signing algorithm none and it will skip checking the signature at all and now it'll just believe whatever you've put into the token, which is clearly wrong, and that was the problem. So what's the takeaway here? The takeaway is that that JSON Web Token header, which talks about how to validate the token, is untrusted information before you validate the signature, and you have to treat it as such. Basically, what that means is never actually let the header determine what signing algorithm is used. Instead, when you go to validate a JSON web token, you should only use signing methods that you know are safe and that you know you're expecting. Thankfully, most JSON web token libraries around 2015, 2016 actually fix this by requiring you to tell it which signing algorithms you are expecting when you go to validate a token. That way you can't be tricked into accepting a signing algorithm from the header itself. All right, let's move on to one of the more subtle ones. So in 2017, there was this attack on Google's OAuth, which resulted in headlines like this. It had various names like an OAuth worm or a phishing attack, but let's take a look at how it worked. First of all, do you see anything wrong with this picture? I'll give you a second to look closely. You might notice that we are really on the real Google OAuth server. It's accounts.google.com. There's a secure lock icon in the address bar. So we know this is actually a page served by Google. This is not a fake page. But it's a little bit suspicious that Google Docs is requesting access to my contacts, for example. One, why does it need access to my contacts? But also, why does it need permission? Because it's Google. But how about if I click this little arrow next to Google Docs, and then I see the application developer who built it, and also the URL that I'm going to be sent to when I authorize this app. What is docscloud.info? Well, I can be pretty sure it's not actually Google. So in OAuth, in order to start a flow, you just need to create a URL and get someone to click on it. Typically, that's the link that says log in. But you could actually deliver that link any way you can think of. You could send it in a bit.ly link over SMS. You could put it in an email, for example, and get someone to click on it. And because anybody can make this link, you can transmit to anybody and start an OAuth flow when they click it. So the way this spread was that the attacker just got one person to click on this link. And as soon as one person did, it granted this application access to that person's address book and the ability to send email from their account. And then this worm can go and use the Google APIs to actually send an email to everybody in their address book. And now that email is not actually a fake email. It's not spam. It's coming from a real Google account going to a real Google account. And what's the contents of that email? It's this message that says, so-and-so shared a file with you. Click here to view it in Google Docs. Now, if you got this email, it's going to be from somebody in your address book. And it's actually a real email. It's not from a fake address. It's from them. So then you go and you click the Open in Docs button, and you get taken to Google, where you're then prompted with this. And because you're already thinking about Google Docs, you're more likely to just click through right here and not even think too much about it. And as soon as you do, now the attacker has an access token to your account and can repeat the process. And that's how it spiraled out of control. So Within about 40 minutes of this, it had spread so far that Google actually had to tweet this out and be like, hey, uh, we're investigating this. Don't click on that link. Meanwhile, on Reddit, where this had been reported, there were Google engineers chiming in, being like, okay, we're looking at it. Oh, we found out what's going on, and we've disabled the app. And at that point, the next time anybody clicked that link, they just saw this error page because what they did was they just disabled the client ID. But if you think about it, that didn't actually solve the problem. That just stopped that particular instance because the problem is actually a lot deeper. The problem is that it's a phishing attack, and phishing attacks often don't have a technical solution because it's all about teaching users what to expect and not to just sort of blindly trust things. And a lot of the reasons that worked was because that screen that asked for the user's permission was so convincing because it was Google's screen, and they didn't do a good enough job of preventing people from impersonating Google apps. So really this problem is all about just making sure users are well informed when they're granting permissions to other applications to access their account over OAuth. So it's a hard problem, and there are several different kinds of solutions, some more heavy-handed than others. All right, the last one I wanna talk about is Facebook. This made major headlines in 2018. 50 million accounts were hacked. 
Now, normally when there's like a large scale hack like this, it's actually something pretty silly. Like if somebody left a database publicly exposed to the internet or someone just stole a password dump and then tried it on some other service. But this one caught my eye because normally companies will just sort of write a high level apology email. But this was actually so serious that Facebook put out a lot of information about exactly what went wrong here. So from their own post, this was a phrase that the VP of product used to describe the attack. The vulnerability was the result of the interaction of three distinct bugs. It wasn't just one problem. And when we look at these three bugs, you'll see that individually, each of these doesn't actually seem that bad and seems like it couldn't cause something at this scale. It's only once you stack them up that it becomes a problem. Facebook has or had this great feature called View As. You could be on your profile page, click View As and see what your page looked like to somebody else. And that was really useful for being able to test out your privacy settings. So that's where this all starts. So here's the text from their statement. First, view as is a privacy feature that lets you see what your page looks like to somebody else. This is supposed to be a view only interface. However, for one type of composer, the little box that lets you post into your profile, the view as incorrectly offered the ability to post a video. But again, by itself, whatever, right? That's not a big deal. Worst you can do is like upload a video to your own wall. Okay. So hold that one in your head for a second. Now, second, they launched a new version of this video uploader. And that version had a bug where it generated an access token that had the permissions of the Facebook mobile app. Now, this is starting to sound a little bit suspicious because what do you mean it generated an access token? That sounds to me like they're letting one part of their system just sort of assert things on behalf of some other part of the application without actually checking it. But again, by itself, this wouldn't be so bad because all that really could happen was that you could use that access token to post to your own account or read your own data. Okay, so hold that one in your head. Third, when the video uploader appeared as part of view as, it generated an access token not for you, the viewer, but instead for the profile you were viewing. Now this is bad. This is clearly bad because now I'm able to get an access token for somebody else's account. But again, if it were only this, it wouldn't have been that bad because the view as was supposed to be a read only interface. But when you stack these, if you use the view as feature to view somebody else's page, you would end up with an access token belonging to that user that had the permissions of the Facebook mobile app. And that's why it started cascading out of control. So what's the moral of the story here? This is again, a pretty tricky one because again, each of these bugs did not seem that bad on their own. But I think the thing that kind of ties it all together is that it's really important to keep clean security boundaries between these different parts of your application. Don't let parts of your application pretend to be other parts or pretend to be users. We have the OAuth framework for a reason, and that's what lets us make sure that the user was involved when issuing an access token for that user. And that is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this. You can get a copy of my book at OAuth2Simplified.com. I also have cat stickers available on that website as well. Thank you so much.